Can we have a little game of catch? Wouldn't you like to do something? Isn't there something you'd like to do? Oh, let me not be mad. Not mad, sweet heaven, cried Shakespeare's King Lear. I would not be mad. When Lear set out that terrible cry of make me not mad, not mad, he did this because this is the worst thing that can happen. I think a person die with equanimity. But it's a very different thing to think that you will be, you'll be destroyed, that your very central being will be assaulted in this way. Schizophrenia, I think, is really the Everest of psychiatry. Schizophrenia is one of the great and massive illnesses. When you realize that there were literally tens and hundreds of thousands of people afflicted, you have to be more detached than I am to see it as it became, in a way, a kind of personal affront. And I think this is a good thing. This is how research in medicine should be. It's a battle. Battle whose stakes are high. What's the matter? Huh? What's the problem? What is schizophrenia? Nobody really knows its cause nor why some people recover and others do not. Yet hidden within its complexities may be the vital clues we need to help us understand ourselves. Suppose you lost the inner guidelines we all need in order to function in this complicated world. Suppose your recollection of your own past became chaotic, without landmarks, and your view of the future despairing. What if you lost your capacity to feel pleasure, lost your sense of identity as a person, and suppose reality, as you had always known it, began to change before your eyes? Life would become a nightmare filled with terrifying fantasies. And for a schizophrenic, this is indeed what life becomes. This illness has existed since the beginning of recorded time. At least one out of every hundred people everywhere suffers from it during some part of his life. Some are in institutions. But many, like René, struggle along in the day-to-day -day world, living a painful, limited life, walking a dangerous tightrope, never knowing when they may be flung back into anguish. By trying to help them, we, the other 99, may finally learn what can help keep us sane. The National Educational Television Network presents Schizophrenia, the shattered mirror. None of the people you are about to see are actors. Schizophrenia varies in its symptoms and its severity. Many schizophrenics are able to function in the world. Then suddenly, or over a period of years, and usually in their youth, they shatter. I remember I was working very hard at my, my dancing, but the strain and the pressure of the dieting and the lack of sleep and the overexhaustion finally began to break, break me, me down. There were fingers touching me on my forehead. They always seemed to touch me as if to warn me to refrain from doing something or to, to stop what I had already begun to do. In time, I became an absolute slave of these things. I remember that I would walk down a street and I would all, all at once have a strange feeling that I should go in a certain direction. I remember looking down a certain street, it would look very strange, as if in a, in a dream. And I would have the feeling I must walk down that street because there was something for me to, to, to see or something that I must do or an experience that I, I, I must have. As these symptoms continued and seemed to get worse and worse, at the same time, I was also withdrawing more and more in, in, into myself. 
sort of like dark, black, ominous clouds gathering over me, like a nightmare that was engulfing me. I had taken that same subway home night after night, and yet I didn't know which train to, to get on. I just broke down and started to, to cry. I was as helpless as a child. And all of a sudden, I burst out screaming. I can't stand it, I can't stand it. They're torturing me, they're after me. These spirits won't let, let, let me alone. Renee first came to see me two years ago when she was admitted to our hospital. Uh, <clears throat> she had been diagnosed schizophrenia at least two years before I first saw her and had received various forms of therapy. Dr. Abram Hoffer, director of psychiatric research, Saskatchewan, Canada. She was schizophrenic. It's very sad, but when people hear the word schizophrenia, they immediately think of a split personality like Jekyll and Hyde or they think of violence or great danger. It's sad because these two things are not true. It's very difficult to diagnose schizophrenia very often, but Renee demonstrates the classical picture of schizophrenia. She had changes in perception. These included changes in her visual field where she saw flashes of light across her visual field, like gems and diamonds and crystals, and this is how she described them. She also felt fingers touching her forehead. These are tactile hallucinations. In addition, she had changes in thinking. And finally, the last classical symptom, she had inappropriate affect. And she was talking about an event where she should have been depressed. She seemed to be inappropriately happy. When she was talking about a cheerful event, she was depressed. I was faced with a very difficult problem in treating Renee. Her parents had brought her from California. It cost them $1,200 a month in our hospital. I didn't want to keep her so long that it would deplete the family finances. And yet I didn't dare send her home too soon because my first responsibility was to Renee. After two or three months, Renee felt that she wanted to come back to New York. She wanted to be independent. And I agreed with her. But Renee, like most schizophrenics, lives on a razor's edge. That is, the symptoms of her schizophrenia couldn't come back at any time. In New York, Renee faces many problems. The most serious one is loneliness. She is a long way from home. She has very few close friends. Renee chose to live in a small, bare room, eight by 10 feet. Now, Renee, probably is more comfortable in a small room, which becomes a kind of shelter or cave where she can feel more secure than she would be in the large, busy streets of New York City. And she considers this room to be cozy. At this point, Renee has been in New York one year. She is taking or trying to keep up with her ballet classes, which is very strenuous physically. This means that she must keep her weight down. And this, in her case, is especially dangerous for her. In addition, Renee is working at two part-time jobs. During the day, she is doing clerical work, which is not very stimulating, and is really a long way away from what she would like to do. In the evening, she is a cashier. Now, this means that she will be home late, and she will not have enough sleep, and therefore will not have the right quantity of rest that she needs. She could relapse at any time. Rene is struggling to stay in the real world. But what is the world from which she has come? Doctors have described it in many ways. Sometimes, when a person finds his current life situation is too much for him, 
then, in a very massive way, he tries to pull out in order to adapt to what is so unbearable to him in life. In order to stay alive, he flees to a world of his own creation with its own rules and its own terrors. And you cannot reach him there. Feel safe up in the tree down here? Yeah. You do? Yeah. You're not afraid of heights? Hmm? You're not afraid of heights? In this cold world of the schizophrenic, there is rarely a relationship with another human being, for each person considers himself alien to the other. Very often, they do not think of themselves as human beings. Many do not know where their own body ends and the outside world begins. And for others, time is not real. A minute may feel like an interminable hour. An hour may race by at terrifying speed. All of us have had such experiences, but fleetingly. What must it be like to live like that always? And what must it be like always to ask those most human of questions? What am I? Who am I? And never to have an answer. Hey, I am I, who are you? I am I, who are you? I am I, who are you? Good, I am I, who are you? Good. I am I. Methods like dance therapy, they are placed in direct contact with others, touching, talking. But once the music stops, they go back within themselves. How can we reach into their strange and private world? Dr. Humphrey Osmond, director of the Bureau of Research in Neurology and Psychiatry for the state of New Jersey, has been trying to do this by developing a series of questions designed to help schizophrenics tell us more about what their inner world is like. He and psychologist Monheim El Maligi got their clues for these questions from long conversations with hundreds of patients. What's the difference? between this face of mine. You can't tell, since you're not looking at me. You only look at this one. Can you? Yes. That's the first time you look at me, since yesterday. Well, I tell. Why did you look at me? I don't make a habit of looking at someone. I beg pardon? I don't make a habit of looking at someone. You don't make a habit of looking at somebody? Mm -hmm. How about the people in general? How quick do you think they are? People in the street and... Some people that are in places that I go, I find they go very quickly. I see. So, Gail, now, you, you feel that people are too fast for you. Yes. What prevents you from being faster? There's the need to get things as right as possible. When you do something, you get it as close to being done as you can. Are you thinking while you are talking? Yes. Uh, you, you told me a while ago that your age is 27. All right, you are 27. How old do you feel? Thirty-five. Your age, your actual age is 27, Seven. and you feel that you are 35. Okay, what makes you feel? older than your own real age? 
because of, because I like to be that old. You like to be that old? I see. Why? What advantage does a person of 35 has over a person of 27? You must have good reasons for that game. Closer than when he dies. Hmm? He's closer than when he dies. He is closer to when he dies. You feel like dying? There's any kind of better life after this one I do. From such indications of what schizophrenics experience in their inner lives, a test is being designed to help them communicate their true feelings and, hopefully, be an aid in diagnosing the illness. As a control, the test is first checked out with normal subjects like this volunteer. Uh, we are here concerned with the way people see themselves, people, other people, and the world in general. And I would like you to read each of those statements and then decide whether it is true as it applies to you or false. See? But don't think too much about it. I have a mental illness. I hope not. My reflection in the mirror looks strange. Well, I can. Most people hate each other. I don't think most people do. <laughs> How many? I think there are a large number of people that hate a lot of other people, but I, I don't think most people. Would you say that they are the majority or the minority? I think they're a small minority. But... Fine. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I feel that my ideas may turn into insects. That's quite silly. Would you think that there are people that sometimes would believe in that? That ideas would turn into insects? It's... Is it possible that a human being would believe in that? I suppose it might. The idea of an idea turning into an insect is, I, I can't comprehend. I, I suppose somebody might think it, but... Um... I feel that my ideas may turn into insects. What do you think? Do you have this feeling or not? Is that true or false? As far as you are concerned? True. That true? Do you feel sometimes that your ideas may turn into insects? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then which box would you put it here? Would you put it here mm -hmm. or there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Fine. Oh. You got the idea. Okay. That's the way. Go ahead now and reach. Read each one, loudly. I do not know what my hands will do next. No, that doesn't apply. To me. Fine. Mm -hmm. Very good. I can hear bright colors. Certainly a funny item, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, fine. But it's false. Mm -hmm. People often laugh at me. So I base it on the way things are now or the way it happened before. Well, just tell me about it now. Let us start by now. Yeah. Now they laugh at me quite they, a lot. Yes, where? At the institute. They laugh at you? Uh, which people are you referring to? The patients. Okay, how about the past? Past they laughed at me too. All right. Okay, then what would the answer be? 
I feel turned to stone. Twelve. That must be very uncomfortable feeling. Have you been feeling that way? Uh, for the past few years. For the past few years. Have you told anybody about that? No. Uh, how do you feel about these questions as you are going through them? Did you like going through them and answering them? Yes. You did? Yes. Uh, what makes you like them? They help you to understand what life is, consists of and what your mind is. I see. It helped help you to understand what life consists in your mind. Most patients who have this kind of psychological and emotional disturbance, uh, when this erupts out of their previous neurosis, uh, still are in contact most of the time. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever seen a patient who is really psychotic, really totally disorganized, 24 hours a day. They move into it and out of it. I have no will of my own. That's false. I'm rotten inside. That's false. There are insects under my skin, that's false. Doesn't seem to be any true ones. <laughs> it is dangerous to touch people, that's false. I have a mental illness, apparently so. Hmm. It's true. Now when it comes to treatment, there are those who put their hope in the use of uh, drugs of many kinds. Now, there can be no question at all but that drugs have helped very disturbed people to be less disturbed and has therefore made it possible for us to get in contact with them, to communicate with them, to influence the underlying problems and feelings and attitudes which they have. Uh, whether drugs alone have a cure is a question about which one will get many disagreements. My personal feeling is if they don't cure but they can sometimes make life livable for people who are otherwise too disturbed to live. And that what is more important, they bring people back into contact, make it possible to make contact with them in a therapeutic way. There are others who believe in the use of various forms of shock treatment. And very much the same thing could be said about the use of shock treatment in relation to the psychotic disorganization, states of psychological disorganization uh, that I've just said about drugs. And there are some who put their whole hope in psychological treatment alone, particularly deep psychoanalytic treatment. Uh, there can be no question that any one of us can point to individual experiences in which people have been helped and perhaps one may justified, be justified in saying even cured by any one of these approaches. But those experiences are still rare. And I'm, my own conviction is that there's going to be, ultimately, ways of integrating and bringing together these various approaches in the treatment of illnesses of this kind. <laughs>